Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's magical video. In the mid-1990s, executives at the Walt Disney Company were actively discussing the state of animation and what the future of the Disney feature animation division would look like after a period of massive successes, huge undertakings, and large budget productions, during a time CEO Michael Eisner was calling the Disney Decade. Together, the executives determined that maybe it was time to try a smaller and less expensive film. Maybe they needed to look for stories in a place they hadn't been focusing on taking inspiration from the production of Dumbo, which was an economically made 1941 Walt Disney film, the execs determined that they would empower a single artist to produce a film in a shorter amount of time with a smaller budget. When Thomas Schumacher, then president of Walt Disney Feature Animation, approached their head storyboard artist Chris Sanders on their idea, what Sanders pitched to the heads over at Disney was a failed storybook from 1985 that had remained dormant in his mind. Believing the character of a lost and lonely alien who happened to stumble onto Earth could not be fully developed the way he envisioned in 24 or 32 pages, Chris had set the tale of the creature aside, but he was convinced that the length of a film might just be enough to explore his little, mischievous, and redeemable alien. Lilo and Stitch was a gem during an age of stagnation for Disney animation, and thrived despite it. Its unique premise, wonderful world, and most importantly its dynamic characters allowed the film to stand amongst the competition of the day, and allowed it to become a beloved franchise. But how did this film retain quality while others couldn't? What sets Lilo and Stitch apart? Hello, I'm Isaac from Watson Videos, where we discuss fun topics for fun people. Today, I'm going to be breaking down the history of one of the most magical Disney franchises that I had the privilege of experiencing during my childhood, Lilo and Stitch. Born and raised in Colorado, Chris Sanders fell in love with animation at the age of 10 after viewing animated shorts on the wonderful world of Disney. From that point on, he began drawing, applied to Cal Arts after his grandmother told him about the animation program at the school, majored in character animation, and graduated in 1984. Soon after, Chris began to work at Marvel Comics, but soon transferred to help be a character designer on the Muppet Babies in that same year. After experiencing a bit of the animation industry, he was able to soon move over to the Walt Disney Company in 1987, where he worked in the visual development department. After doing some minor work on The Rescuers Down Under, Sanders rose to the top of Disney animation in the early 1990s through his work on Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, allowing him to become a writer and the head of story on Mulan after those previous projects had been completed. It was here, during his time on Mulan, where Chris would come to meet a man who he would collaborate with for years to come. Chris Sanders would soon meet Dean DeBlois. By simultaneously working as an assistant animator and layout artist for Hinton Animation Studios in Ottawa, Ontario, and attending Sheridan College's classical animation program, Dean was ready to graduate in 1990 to begin his career in the animation world. Deblois was immediately hired after his graduation by Don Bluth Studios in Dublin, Ireland, where he worked as a layout artist, character designer, and storyboard assistant on films like Thumbelina and A Troll in Central Park. In 1994, though, Deblois left Ireland to pursue his new position as a storyboard artist for Walt Disney Feature Animation in the Florida Animation Studio where he would begin by working on Mulan. Due to a shortage of storyboard artists working on the film in California, though, where the writers were developing the narrative of Mulan, Dean was quickly sent to California to assist that team. But there was a bit of miscommunication with the story team. I arrived there, no one really knew what to do with me, and they hadn't heard that I was coming, and so I just started working with the story guys. In the very beginning of Mulan, we didn't have a lot of layouts we needed, so um, Dean asked if he could come over. As I remember it, Dean asked to come over and do some story, and he did, and he was great. And it didn't take long before all of us were going, well, can Dean just stay in story? Everyone, including Pam Coates, then executive vice president of feature animation at Disney, was extremely impressed by what Dean was bringing to the story development as he was able to develop emotionally heavy scenes that required very little revisions. You know, Dean, you're staying in story. You're not going to go anywhere. You're going to stay right here in story and do the movie with us. And that's how they initially met, Dean and Chris met on Mulan. With Dean now active within building the story of Mulan, his friendship with Chris could begin. A veteran leader within Disney feature animation and a natural storyteller were paired together, which meant ideas were sure to come from this friendship. 
They just needed the opportunity to explore an idea together. And soon enough, Thomas Schumacher would give them that chance. After being asked by CEO Michael Eisner to identify someone who could lead a small and inexpensive film, Schumacher approached Chris Sanders around 1996. Based on the successes behind his previous works, Chris's contract gave him the opportunity to take on the reins to write again and even direct a film. But Thomas explained that with this initiative, Walt Disney Animation wanted him to accomplish all of this within his very own feature film, as long as he had an idea. Soon after the opportunity came to Chris, his mind led him back to his storybook from 1985 of the lonely alien creature. And once Chris's mind began to latch hold of this idea again, one of the first people he approached with this concept was Dean. At this point though, there was no Lilo or Hawaii, it was just about an alien. At a karaoke restaurant at the Swan Hotel in Florida, Sanders told Schumacher about his story idea of an alien who would crash land in a forest where he would be left alone and isolated from the other forest creatures. Believing the wild would not provide enough of a contrast for the alien, Thomas suggested that the story could be more engaging if the alien was immersed within the human world. Out of that conversation came the idea that the destructive alien would be paired with a child. That was the mission statement, like an alien and a, and a little kid, you know, have to sort of figure each other out along the story towards his path to redemption. Early on, as Chris and Dean discussed the story during their lunch breaks and off hours, they came to realize that what they desired to tell was a much more intimate story than either of them had worked on in the past, especially after coming off of the epic of Mulan. They weren't interested in pushing the technology of animation forward, but to tell an encapsulated story that was unique and was unexpected. Beyond having an extraterrestrial befriending a human girl, one of the first choices that defined this seemingly weird project was to have their alien land in Hawaii. Originally, they intended to have the story take place in Kansas or somewhere else in rural America, as this location would be remote and non-urban as they desired, but they instead decided to change the film setting to the Hawaiian island of Kauai, as this place could have a more unique feeling to it while still being isolated. They would bring their alien to a place that had a small town atmosphere and had real visual impact and flavor. The choice of setting their story in Hawaii added heavy stylization to their story, while also assisting them in more clearly defining their plot. To convince the executives at the Walt Disney Company of this small but impactful story Chris and Dean desired to tell, Chris developed a concept pamphlet in around two weeks that was sent off to the Disney higher-ups. Detailed in the booklet was the rough story the duo had discussed, along with extremely stylized illustrations of Chris's vision for the character designs that went mostly unchanged through production. While the alien, who was now named Stitch, especially needed to be balanced between cute and repulsive, for the most part, this was a showcase of what Chris and Dean wanted to create. And through this pamphlet, they were able to get the executives to be receptive to their story. It was a great idea to include the illustrations because it immediately gave an idea of how cute it was. You know, by description, an alien coming into this, you know, this little Hawaiian village and disruption, disrupting this girl's life. And it had a lot of dark tones to it. So he wanted to balance it and give the right, you know, the right imagery to sort of leaven it and give it a, a cute feel. Moving forward with Michael Eisner's plan of creating a very low budget and fast film, Chris and Dean's project was given a budget of $80 million, which relative to the $130 million budget for Tarzan, the $127.5 million budget for Dinosaur, the $120 million for Atlantis The Lost Empire, and the whopping $140 million for Treasure Planet, this was small by comparison. What the duo received in return, though, was much more story freedom as they were left alone by the studio. Together, Chris and Dean were both placed onto the project as co-writers and co-directors, and for the first year, it was only the two of them writing and storyboarding their story. Their initial meetings began off hours with pizza and beer, as they enjoyed the isolation from upper management, unlike the other Disney feature animation projects that were going on at the time. While a part of them was concerned that they would create something too personal for mass audiences, they focused in on themselves to be critical of their own work as they crafted their character-driven story. 
Building off of the characters from Chris's pamphlet, the duo came to understand the identities of Stitch, a wild and unruly alien, his friend Lilo, who was a passionate but lonely little girl, and Lilo's older sister, who was a struggling yet supportive person, along with the likes of the aliens Jumba, Pleakley, the Grand Councilwoman, and the social worker. While the backstory of Stitch was different at this point compared to the final version, as he was currently the leader of an intergalactic gang and the identity of the social worker was far from Cobra Bubbles, all of the personalities and profiles of these individuals in the film were being understood on a deep level. Dean would later explain that, what Chris and I like to do is not only imbue very human traits into the characters, making them very fallible and giving them little moments of nobility here and there. We also like to incorporate real life problems. We have this whimsical and at times ridiculous fantastic backdrop, the whole alien presence, but we also want to deal with the issues of loss and what is a family and how do you define that. Being this is a Disney film, there's a certain legacy of family themes. It's kind of neat to update that and include all of those people who might have not previously been considered part of families. The duo desired the whole film to test boundaries. Not only did they want to show the humanity within characters and the reality of many families, but specifically they wanted to push how they articulated the redemption story of Stitch. They wanted to see how manic and wild and misbehaved he could be while also making him likable, vulnerable, and lovable in the end. All these desires were in Dean and Chris's mind as they developed their story. From the very beginning, it's been hard for me to explain to people what it's like to find the story, and I do mean find it. My impression has always been that there is a story somewhere in the zone of where you're going, and if you're very sensitive to what the movie begins to tell you, that you will actually find that story. And in Lilo and Stitch, it was no exception. As their vision for Lilo and Stitch became more solidified, Dean and Chris had a deeper understanding of their characters, and they were discovering the themes that would tie their story together. But this meant their idea would need more people other than the primary duo to bring the vision to life. Clark Spencer was assigned to produce the film, and with him came 350 other artists and supporters of the film Dean and Chris were making. But that didn't mean the creators would be any less interactive in the details of their project. They were in there with the other members of their team to engage with them and to make sure that the film got made in a smarter and faster way that avoided reinterpretation. In April of 1999, the team knew that the destructive force that was Stitch would be the entity that would almost break the sisters, Nani and Lilo, until at the end, they would all be united and transformed by family. But Dean and Chris hadn't fully fleshed out that concept until they took a trip to Kauai to research the locale. The creators desire to show a complete deviation from the rigid structure of family they had portrayed in Mulan, while continuing to show the importance of family was cemented when they learned of the concept of Ohana. While learning to understand the unique nature of the culture and the environment their characters were meant to live within, along with depicting the island in its realist sense, which was juxtaposed with the island's serene beauty and economic struggles of the time, their tour guide taught them about how the concept of Ohana applied to extended families, which became extremely important to them as they felt it opened up the door to unconventional families. Lilo and Nani did not have a typical family. But Chris and Dean wanted to emphasize that their love for one another and their struggle to keep themselves together was no less legitimate when their relationship was being shown. Ohana was how they could remain together and why they would accept an alien to be a part of their family. Deploy recalled, Ohana so influenced the story that it became the foundation theme, the thing that causes Stitch to evolve despite what he was created to do, which is to destroy. In October of 1999, the team was able to show a screening of their rough version of their film, and it was clear they had an understanding of how they desired to set up and conclude the first and third acts respectively, but weren't convinced on how the story was progressing in the second act. They were not pleased with the heavy moments that were weighing the scenes down, and were not convinced that their complex characters 
deserved the limited actions that were taking place. What Chris and Dean decided was that they had to focus on the story they were looking to tell, regardless if that meant they had to turn away from typical practices in their storytelling method. By adding sequences like when Lilo tries to teach Stitch to be Elvis, and when they teach Stitch to surf, they were able to brighten the second act and build upon the complexity of these moments. We felt that the notion of sequences, which we've always worked with here at Disney, was harming us because a sequence by definition has a one sentence title. Yeah, well, you've got a whole sequence now where by definition only one thing is going to happen. And we felt after seeing our second act that so few things happened and our characters were so rich and so intricate that they should be meshing more and we should have much more layers happening at once. So we decided to discard the notion of sequences and just talk about the film as a series of days and what, <laughs> what we want to have happen. As test audiences continued to give feedback on the film, and as the story was being revised to approach its final form, the team approached the point where the animation process would begin, which meant animators would soon be creating the unified and intriguing world and characters of Lilo and Stitch. And now that the duo accepted they would create the film as they saw fit, they were ready to take a new approach to what they wanted their story to look like. The thought process was that since they were creating a new type of film for the Walt Disney Company, that they should have it look different as well. Dean and Chris went back to films that inspired them, like Dumbo, and decided to adopt some of the methods that were used to bring that film to life. To capture the beauty of Hawaii, the feeling of a storybook, and the art direction of Dumbo, all of the backgrounds were done using watercolor, as opposed to the gouache technique, which had become standard since the mid-1940s. To accomplish this look the creators desired, background artists had to be trained in the medium that hadn't been used in over 50 years, a return to form for Disney animation. Not only did Chris push for the watercolor for the backgrounds to alter the aesthetic of their Disney film, but he also altered Disney's traditional house style in favor of his character designs. Lead artists had to adapt Chris's techniques as they created the final versions of the characters that would appear in the film, which emphasized curves over straight edges. The adaptation to Chris's work was even applied to the film's extraterrestrial elements as well, which were also designed to resemble marine life so they would feel connected with the exotic and oceanic land of Hawaii. As the animation team was learning how they would create Chris and Dean's world, at the end of 1999, the character animators would be assisted in their work as voice recordings began to occur, which would continue through 2001. The way it usually works is you don't have a design to look at because that's usually the job of the supervising animator. There are some rough storyboards and the characters look a certain way but they are not finalized yet and they might not have a voice yet. So you look at the storyboards and you start fiddling around with some designs. Then all of a sudden they find somebody, they have an idea for a voice. Then you listen to the voice tracks, you go back to your drawing and make sure that it would seem that that voice would come out of that character. As Andreas Deja, the supervising animator for Lilo, explained, the final versions of the characters could only truly come when final voices were being associated with their animated counterparts. So, at this point in the film's journey, Lilo, Stitch, and the other aliens and humans could finally be brought to life. Davy Chase became the adorable and misunderstood Lilo. It's all you! Knock him dead! Tia Carrera became Lilo's caring older sister Nani. This isn't what it looks like. David Ogden Styers transformed into the brash Jumba Jukiba. Oh, I just remembered. Ah, it's your birthday. Happy birthday. Kevin McDonald embodied Pleakley. They like me. They're doubling my flesh with their noses. Ving Rams was Cobra Bubbles. Uh, okay. Zoe Cladwell embodied the Grand Councilwoman. He won't survive in water. His molecular density is too great. And of course, Chris Sanders himself was Stitch. So there's this little voice that I do to annoy friends at work. Chrissy, Chrissy. And uh, to amuse myself. Chrissy, I love you. What are you doing? And I would assign that little noise to Stitch. So no, Dean wisely said, well, you make those noises all the time. Why don't you just start doing the voice and we'll see what happens later. Every time we had a recording session, I would just go in at the end of the recording session, do a little bit, we'd stick it in. I think that people just simply got used to it after a while. I got used to it, everybody got used to it. <laughs> 
These voice actors added humor and emotion to the roles they became, but the Hawaiian voice actors also helped in a different way. The Hawaiian voice actors assisted with rewriting their dialogue in the proper colloquial dialect, while also adding Hawaiian slang terms to ensure each character in integration felt authentic. The details of the world and story were slowly coming together as Chris and Dean worked with the many creative and dedicated individuals around them. Now, with a unified vision for the character and background designs, in August 2000, the animation process began. Storyboards of the Wild Alien Stitch were finally going to be developing into something more. The story was coming to life, but that didn't mean it was perfect. If you're involved in the storytelling, it's excruciating because really, you're putting everything that you believe to be funny or endearing or, you know, emotionally engaging or exciting up on screen and you're expecting people to tap into your particular tastes and, and appreciate your sensibilities and it's not always the case. Here's the actual review. Yada, 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 yada. That was the review! The whole film was yada, yada, yada. In May of 2001, test screenings were fully underway, which continued to point out the flaws of the film that removed viewers from the experience they were supposed to be having. For one, when Jumbo was attacking Stitch in Lilo's home, audiences found the violence to be too much, so this scene was reworked by the duo to be more comedic in nature. Test screenings also showed that Nani and Lilo's relationship as sisters wasn't as clear as the creators would have liked. Often audiences felt uncomfortable with the girls screaming at one another because they thought Nani was Lilo's mother. So the girls' apology to one another was rewritten by Sanders to make their relationship clear. As Dean and Chris began to look over the animation process with more scrutiny around August of 2001, a big issue arose around how they had initially characterized Stitch. He was a cute and mischievous creature, but many of the Disney creatives felt that it would be difficult to root for him if he was consciously making the decisions to be a criminal at the beginning of the film. Instead, Chris and Dean reworked Stitch to not be a leader of a gang of aliens, but instead have Jumba be his creator. Therefore, throughout the film, Stitch is forced to fight against his purpose to destroy. The decision to alter Stitch, though, had ramifications for Stitch's relationship with Lilo. Originally, Stitch and Lilo were meant to be mirrors of one another, as Lilo's broken family and bad behavior would be similar to Stitch's conditions when he became a criminal. When Stitch was reimagined as Experiment 626, though, Lilo and Stitch were altered to relate more to one another based on their feelings of loneliness instead of their misbehavior. But none of these alterations would be as large or as sudden as the one that would be forced to occur due to the horrifying events of September 11, 2001. Originally, the climactic finale was meant to have Stitch stealing a Boeing 747 jet so he could go after and save Lilo. The thought process was from Chris and Dean was that Stitch may have learned the importance of family, but hadn't given up being impulsive and destructive when he was attempting to help the people he loved in his life. Gantu was meant to attempt to avoid Stitch by flying through the metropolitan area in between tall buildings and skyscrapers, but after the Twin Towers fell on 9-11 due to passenger jets taking them down, the sequence felt wrong to include. I think that the neatest thing that happened within the studio was how everybody came together to make that change. Come back to the studio several days later, we said, just to let you know, we have a new plan in effect. The sequence is already being worked on, taking all of the city streets out and replacing them with mountain canyons. There was just, you know, from, from the California side, from Tom Schumacher and the execs that have said, thanks for doing that. By remodeling the 747 into the spaceship that Jumba and Pleakley took to Earth, and by animating a few new shots along with altering the skyscrapers to be mountainsides, the sequence was successfully revised while still preserving the fun and excitement of the original. In November 2001, as most of the scenes became solidified or were approaching completion in the animation process, Chris and Dean secured their top choice for the artists who would compose their whimsical score, Alan Silvestri. What Alan brought was the ability to support the storytelling that the creators had spent years developing by crafting sweeping scores that could build both emotion and the empowering moments. Around this time, they also were able to have Mark Kalili Ho Omalu write Hey Mele No Lilo and Hawaiian Roller Coaster Ride, which were both performed in part by the Kamahamahea School's Children's Choir and they were approved by Elvis's estate to include his music into the film. 
As the finishing touches were made to the movie, the creators and crew were led to discuss how they would market their film. While at first they considered showing shorts of Lilo and Stitch interacting, they felt those might not be effective at showing what the movie was about, since the two would be in conflict throughout the film. What Chris and Dean eventually discovered was that their best chance of having audiences connect with their story was through Stitch himself. Hey, that's not Simba! <laughs> Therefore, the team developed numerous teaser trailers, which were referred to as interstitials, that featured Stitch crashing some of Disney's Renaissance films and showing him off as someone who was wild, goofy, and who didn't belong. Original voice actors returned for the trailers, and some new animation was done to bring them to life and with it came hilarious teasers that captured attention. Finally though, the film was completed, and soon after Chris Sanders and Dean DeBlois' small project became the 42nd Walt Disney feature animated film, as it was finally unveiled to the public on June 21st, 2002, on 3,191 screens across North America. And this film was met with praise by critics, fans, and myself. In the summer of 2002, I was four years old, and this was the first Disney movie I remember seeing in theaters, and I immediately loved it. Much like critics, I adored the unique location, the powerful score, hilarious characters, and the wild stitch. The story brought me on an adventure unlike anything I had ever seen, and I enjoyed every moment. But as I've gotten older, I've been able to appreciate more of the depth that Chris and Dean put into their film. The movie was consistently beautiful and stylized in a way that is gorgeous. Stitch was just iconic and hilarious throughout the whole film, but that was juxtaposed with a lot of heart, serious conversations, and deep hardships and themes. Chris and Dean were exploring mature ideas with realistic characters whose struggles became more and more relevant to me as the years have went on. While when I was growing up, Lilo and Stitch's relationship was what drew me in, as I have gotten older, I continually feel more sympathy for the adult characters like Nani. Even though this wasn't a sweeping grand musical, and the stakes were intimate and personal, the story doesn't feel any less powerful. I have so much fun when I watch this movie, and I feel the weight of everything that is said and done. Lilo and Stitch means so much to me, and that is also in part because of what came after it. Due to the success of the film in August of 2003, Disney released the direct-to-video sequel, Stitch the Movie, which led into the show Lilo and Stitch the Series, which ran from September 20th, 2003 to July 29th, 2006. This 65 episode show continued the themes of family, kept the adventures going for Lilo and Stitch, and expanded upon the lore of the aliens by introducing us to the 625 experiments that came before Stitch, who needed to be rehabilitated like Stitch had been. I would watch the show before school and every day record the new experiment names and numbers so I had my own log of who all the experiments were. That television show that I had a blast with was concluded with the TV movie Leroy and Stitch, which aired on June 23rd, 2006. Disney also released Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch has a glitch on August 30th, 2005 as a direct-to-video sequel that took place before Stitch the movie. Disney, of course, have also released tons of Stitch merchandise, have created numerous video game titles, and Stitch even received his own attraction in the Magic Kingdom. Titled Stitch's Great Escape, guests were able to witness Stitch escape an alien base starting on November 16th, 2004. But ever since the film released, Stitch has been a frequent meet and greet character in Disney parks around the world, and is often included with Mickey and the gang. In October of 2018, Walt Disney Pictures even announced the development of a live-action remake of Lilo and Stitch. All of the success came from the creation of a unique film back in 2002. So what makes Lilo and Stitch so special? The reason this animated film was able to be as unique, powerful, and fun as it was came from it being purely and unabashedly the passion project of Chris Sanders and Dean DeBlois. Taking full advantage of the creative freedom from Michael Eisner and the other Disney executives, they created a film that explored an unusual, quirky, and more personal story. By giving up their budget, they bought themselves freedom, 
which gave them the ability to shape the story as they wanted. Beginning with just conversations around pizza came a story that was able to break rules and bend traditions that was able to thrive due to its focus on putting characters and exploring hardships first. They discussed new ideas for Disney audiences and executed on it in a way that made the story feel real, even when aliens were flying around the exotic islands of Hawaii. There was simply a focus on creating a story that was their own through the aesthetic, the narrative, and the characters. And these decisions to return to new and interesting ideas led this animated story to come to life for millions of people. Due to the creative force of Chris and Dean, they gave us a story that allowed us to fall in love with a little blue, naughty, thoughtful, and lovable alien named Stitch and believe that he deserved an Ohana. Hey fun people, thank you for watching this video, which was brought to you by my friends over at Squarespace. Whether you're interested in creating a blog on your favorite film, writing posts about your favorite Disney snack, or are looking to showcase your work experience, Squarespace is a platform that will allow you to easily create a powerful and beautiful website to accomplish these goals. Between being able to choose from tons of designer and award-winning templates, and the ability to manage blogs with their mobile app, Building and managing a website has never been simpler, which means your voice and your message can be heard in a smaller amount of time than ever before. I've developed my website with Squarespace to allow me to consolidate what I'm doing and help me start new projects, which gets me excited for all of you who are looking to seize the opportunities that await you online. I've tried other methods of creating a website and I've never experienced a simpler option, which is why I truly recommend the service. For all of you who are looking to share your passion on the internet, go to squarespace.com slash videos to get a free trial of their service on them and 10% off your first purchase. To see more documentary styled videos like this one, let me know what you would like to see next in the comment section. And if you'd like to continue to see more magical discussions like this one, then don't forget to click that subscribe button and the beautiful bell if you're new. Also, thank you to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon who are amazing supporters of my videos. And as always, Thanks for watching and have a magical day.